Um, and I think the, the good place to start just to talk about a market overview is to look at globally how markets are performing. And we were talking this morning here about the fact that the US market is back to all time record highs again. Um, and that's, that's despite the fact that we have our fourth wave of COVID, we have record numbers of uh, kids in hospitalization, we have more deaths coming through. And it's kind of weird to think that the news is so negative, but the stock markets are so positive. Um, if you look at the history, even the European markets are pretty close to all time highs already too, but they've been much slower track than the, the track of the US market. The US market really has performed very strongly. Um, arguably, China is another interesting case study to look at because they tackled COVID very aggressively and first. Um, they've had a zero COVID policy, which has been most successful, and they've benefited from the recoveries globally with trade. Um, but their stock market has actually turned over and starting to soften, and it has been for months. So really different performance paths for different places in the world, but nothing to do with COVID cases, obviously. Uh, if we look at the US market from a valuation perspective, it's sort of interesting too, because obviously at all time highs, you think the market might be expensive. Um, but what this chat scatter plot on the right shows is uh, every dot is a month. We've got the interest rates on the horizontal and we've got the PE ratio on the vertical. And you can see as interest rates go down, the PE ratio goes up and it's supported at those levels. And so a lot of people have said that because interest rates in the US are so low, it actually does support the valuations. And where we were a couple of months ago, the orange dot, that's pretty true. We're pretty close to this gray trend line. Um, I guess what you could say is um, we need earnings to come through. You can see the purple dots here, that's the tech bubble, where interest rates were a lot higher, but the PE ratios were stretched versus the, like, because obviously the earnings never came through. The prices went up on the expectations of tech bubble earnings growth and it never came through. So that it turned out to be rich valuations. We also run the risk, I guess, if earnings don't come through, we run the risk of a headwind if rates do start to go up. And that's why the inflation conversation here um, is so important. And what the Fed's doing this week is so important in terms of tapering as well. If we um, look at a sector level in the US, it's kind of interesting. You can see a few patterns too. Obviously we had the fastest drawdown and bear market in the US history. We've had one of the fastest bounce backs as well, but we can see it wasn't even across the spectrum. And so tech, which is the blue line here, has had by far the best performance. Um, and that's another reason why the US market has outperformed the world because we have a much bigger tech sector. We have a lot of the tech companies. Um, communication services with the, the way that Gix redid their sectors has a lot of the tech companies in it too. Um, and so those two sectors have really benefited initially from working from home, but then they've also benefited from low interest rates um, and, and sort of growth of their PE multiples as well. You can see some other trends in here. Um, healthcare uh, has obviously not drawn down as much because this was a healthcare uh, recession, but it hasn't really outperformed coming through um, as we've kind of gone back to work and, and started to think that we could get back to a new normal. But what you do see is once the vaccine came out sort of around about the US election time, um, a bounce in energy, a bounce in financials, really a recovery in the value trade. Um, and they started to outperform some of the growth stocks. Interest rates went up in this period as well, especially in the US with all the stimulus that was coming into the system. People really started to fear overheating. Um, and so with the forecast of future rates, we just talked about the headwinds that growth stocks would, would face. We saw a pivot back to growth. Um, that does seem to have faded recently and rates have come down as well. So that's kind of the backdrop of what's going on. One of the interesting things we looked at when we were in the middle of COVID was what was going on in ETFs. And so on the right hand side here, we created a score sheet that looked at um, ETFs with a lot of assets growth, excessive volumes. Um, and big price returns. And so what we ended up doing was you sort of scored those scores together with a combo score. And we looked at which ETFs were the most interesting from a fund flows, returns and, and trading perspective. And you can see um, the Jets ETF, which is Global Airlines, um, was really active on the way up in the green and on the way down in the red. Um, so they came in a one and three. You can see a lot of other thematic trends though. That's what really came out was how many people pivoted to ETFs during um, the COVID lockdowns to put on thematic trades. So looking at a recovery in construction, looking at um, a recovery in energy and oil, pretty clear when you look at some of the tickers that are in here. Um, and also a lot of people playing cloud computing, online retail, 
um, which turned out to be big winners in um, in the COVID work from home environment, as well as leisure and entertainment, which was, as we'll see in some of the data, really badly hurt and is a recovery story. So you can see some of the ETFs being used for thematics. So to sort of give some background into why people did all those things, um, it's kind of interesting to compare the level of stimulus and where the different countries are in a GDP perspective right now. So if we look at Europe, um, obviously huge amounts of stimulus in the system, but compared to other regions and compared to the US, um, not really much at all. So the US stimulus kind of does stand out as really significant. I think it explains a lot why our GDP is back above pre-COVID levels where the rest of Europe's still down recovering and a V-shaped recovery, but not nearly as strong a recovery as the US, which sort of explains and ties back to the equity market performance as well. But what happened with that stimulus, obviously, in the US, and this is important for employment, is if you look at what people could spend money on back in the middle of COVID after we saw the V-shaped bounce, it was a lot of goods that people could buy with their stimulus checks. It wasn't a lot of services. We still couldn't go on holidays. We were still quarantining. People weren't that comfortable going into hotels or restaurants, going to sporting events. A lot of the, the sporting season was done uh, with empty stadiums. And so there was a lot less spending on services. The real recovery in GDP has come pretty much exclusively through the goods sector. And so that's had a couple of interesting implications. One, you can see the goods line is below the services line. So there's a lot more employment in the services sector, which explains why the GDP recovery here has been far outpacing the employment recovery. We still have about 7 million people looking for jobs, even though the unemployment rate doesn't really show that. Um, but the good sector has also had other pressures. Uh, if you look at um, sort of the sector by sector outputs, you can see a lot of home supply, um, a lot of uh, construction sector did really well. And you can see the airlines, cruise lines, movie theaters. I won't give away what happened after January just yet, but the services sector you can see really did struggle in terms of spending, in terms of, uh, of their economies. What you can see uh, when you look at retail spending as well is the impact in the US of the stimulus checks. So we had huge stimulus checks pretty quickly after the COVID lockdowns. And then we had a couple more stimulus checks um, in January. And then once um, Biden took over uh, in February, March, and you can see as soon as those checks went out, spending in retail picked up. Um, we're actually starting to see that sort of taper off a little bit. People are now having to dip back into their savings. Um, spending is still at a very high level, but it hasn't been growing like it was when those stimulus checks came through. And so you can see the impact of the stimulus check on retail sales, which obviously flows through into product demand and the manufacturing sector. You can also see the impact of that if we look at things like inventory levels. So inventory levels fell really quickly and they've been getting tighter and tighter um, as the recovery has gone on to the point where a lot of manufacturers, a lot of clients that I'm talking to, issuing clients, um, have been asking lots of questions about um, shortages, supply constraints, and just the costs that are starting to accrue for manufacturers and producers. So on the left-hand side here, we can see different um, shipping rates, which have gone up from relatively low levels, you know, more than five-fold increase in some cases. And customers have been talking about this as well. They are definitely seeing um, not only bottlenecks at ports, but just a much higher cost of shipping um, all of the trade that's been, been, I guess, fired back up and gone back to COVID levels, pre-COVID levels too. That has um, translated into an increase in input costs and also an increase in um, in output prices as well. So you can see some pressure here. Um, this is uh, you know, prices paid indexes on the manufacturing side, um, pressure on inflation, which is just starting to, to moderate a little bit as everybody, um, I guess, gets back to normal, stops spending all their stimulus checks and starts going on vacation. Um, but real pressure on um, producers, on their prices, on their margins, pushing through into inflation in the US and a fear here that we might be overheating our economy. Um, but as I talked about, the services sector really is where the unemployment situation needs its help. And the vaccines were very important to get the services sector going again. You can see that in this chart here. Um, and so uh, we, we sort of stopped that last chart in January where the movie theaters and airlines had sort of flatlined. You can see once the vaccine started to roll out in the US, 
confidence to do those things, consumers very quickly got back on the train, so to speak, and, and or literally, um, airlines, uh, movies, um, going back to the gym, everything picked up um, much more quickly after the vaccines rolled out. We have, um, up until recently, seated diners back at pre-COVID levels. So we had a lot of those services sectors um, with demand really quickly picking up back to pre-COVID levels because of the confidence the vaccines gave us. And what that did was it did increase employment. Um, what happened was a lot of people still weren't ready to come back to work for um, health reasons or because schools weren't open and so looking after children was a problem. And so we've actually seen a lot of pressure on wages. And I've been hearing this from talking to issuers as well is, you know, if you're in the, the even in the manufacturing sector, but if you're in the retail sector, if you're in the hospitality sector, the pressure on wages to try and keep people, to try and get people to come to work um, has been dramatic. And you see um, big wage inflation pressures coming through on the services sector too. So um, what that's translating to, if you look at the real data in the US, is the inflation numbers here are very strong, much stronger than we're seeing in Europe, although there is an uptick in inflation. Uh, and the levels of inflation, I mean, the headline level, which includes all items, is if we kind of skip this, which was a hurricane-induced shortage, um, multi-decade high levels of inflation in the US. Remember the Fed targets a 2% inflation rate. So right now we're well above 2% and it's been this way for a couple of months now. The Fed tends to look more at the core inflation number, which takes out some of the things like um, food and energy that sort of have supply constraints and cause price spikes that come back down to normal, um, very short-term price spikes. But even the core rate of inflation is well above the Fed's target rate. And that's why um, when we saw the stimulus money coming through after the election, a lot of people um, bid up the interest rates or I guess sold off the 10-year um, the treasuries. And we saw interest rates go up uh, 100 basis points uh, in the space of about six months. And that created some headwinds for stocks, even as the recovery is happening and uh, as unemployment was getting even better. So. When we look at, um, like I said, talking to issuers, some of the mentions in um, company earnings calls, inflation is definitely a hot topic. A lot of customers on the issuer side, a lot of companies are talking about um, price pressures, inflation pressures, um, input costs going up. So really in the US, we have kind of two different, I guess, tail risks that people are talking about right now. And meanwhile, the market's sort of chugging a little bit sideways, but at pretty close to all time highs. When we look at the returns in the US for the last few years, you can see the returns here are all positive, the little blue dots. Um, most of 2019 and 2020 though, the reason the market was up was this orange bar, which is the expansion of price earnings multiples. And that happens like we talked about before, when the interest rates go down, you can slide up that PE multiple rate. And so you can see in the, in the 10 year rate, 2019, 2020, interest rates were falling, PE multiples were helping stocks to grow. That's all changed. So the, the difference we have now in 2021 is the outperformance of the market's being driven by earnings. We've actually seen rates start to tick back up a little bit. And so that's held the, the PE multiple expansion back. It has already become a bit of a headwind on stocks, but earnings season has been very strong. And we've, we've already seen through all the data, there is a lot of demand in the US. There's a lot of stimulus money. There is still quite a lot of savings. People are coming back to work pretty quickly. Um, there is a risk of overheating. The Fed's obviously meeting this week. Um, the expectation is they're going to start tapering at some time, if not late this year, into next year. And we will start to then talk about whether rates go up and how much and what that does to stocks from an overheating and, and rate rising perspective. Of course, the, the flip side is what could happen um, if COVID takes over. And it's kind of ironic because overheating is a risk of things getting too hot. COVID is a risk of things getting too cold. Um, we know in the US, we got our vaccinations going sort of January, February. We had a big head start on Europe, um, but countries like Canada um, and Europe have now caught up to the US and passed um, us in terms of the vaccination rates. And part, because of that, the US um, fourth wave of COVID is looking pretty dramatic. And you can see in the um, consumer confidence that came through this week, we had, as we kind of came out of COVID with all the stimulus money, confidence was coming back and the last couple of weeks confidence has again plummeted so the impact of COVID even if we've learned to live with it even if it hasn't really slowed the economy down anymore um, it's definitely changing consumer confidence and we can see that happening um, across 
uh, restaurant bookings. We can see it changing consumer um, patterns in terms of airline bookings and hotels and travel. And that's obviously going to change um, company earnings projections and revenues potentially as well. So COVID is this opposite tail risk of a slowdown. Um, we're seeing the slowdowns happen around other countries in the world as well. So um, if you look at the data coming out of Asia, a lot of those countries are back into lockdowns. They're not very well vaccinated and their economies are slowing because of their lockdowns. So COVID is still a global risk. Um, a lot of economists talk about it being a bigger risk for emerging markets where the vaccines haven't made it. Um, the costs of vaccines per person are much, I, I guess you'd say, more prohibitive to be broadly vaccinated than countries like Europe and the US where we're talking about booster shots um, just to keep people healthy enough that we're not in hospitals. So totally, it's sort of a different problem to solve in the emerging markets world um, if COVID starts to spread there uh, more than it has so far. Um, India obviously excluded. The second thing that's interesting to talk about um, in sort of the second half of the time that I've got is just to look at what's going on in the retail land of um, the US especially. And that also is related to stimulus checks. So if we look at what happened to personal income and consumer spending in the US, you can see the two stimmy check periods here boosted income significantly. So the amount of stimulus was in the orders of trillions of dollars, um, actually created an increase in income, even though we were going into COVID lockdowns. And ironically, the people that still had jobs weren't spending because they were in COVID lockdowns. So they were cooking for themselves. They weren't going on holidays. They weren't flying in planes. And actually, we started to save money if we still had jobs. People that didn't have jobs got stimulus checks. And the net gap between income and spending increased. And that happened around the world. If you look at some of the data, um, people expect that the amount of net savings from employed people not spending as much and from unemployed people with benefits adds up to three, nearly $4 trillion um, in that sort of period of time. So that's a huge amount of extra cash that people have to deploy. And in the US, what's interesting is just looking at whether people deployed that into the stock market. So there's a few different places we can look to see whether that's true. Um, this chart on the left looks at the number of trades that happen per day at retail brokerages. And a couple of things happened um, around the time of COVID. So late in 2019, in the US, almost all of the brokerages went to a zero commission world um, where you can trade for free. And then you can see that definitely had an impact on some of their uh, customer behavior where trading started to increase. And I guess arguably it nearly doubled in the next sort of quarter or so. But really the big increase seemed to happen when the COVID lockdown happened. And so people were at home, they might've been unemployed, they had all these stimulus checks, um, a lot less things to do with their time. And we saw a huge increase in uh, retail trading activity. And I can show you a couple of other charts. It, it sort of seems to be the case that retail activity, retail contribution to US liquidity has increased significantly during the stimulus check environment. Um, this chart on the right is just one example. So this is looking at people downloading the Robinhood software. So Robinhood is a, um, it's a new IPO uh, on NASDAQ. It uh, is a free commission broker. It has been since it started, but it's a relatively new one. And so they saw a huge amount of downloads of their software when the stimulus checks came through, which is sort of, a, I guess, a sign that um, people with their money were looking at ways to now trade in the stock market. We can also look at some of this data from the marketplace, looking at net buying um, of equities. And so typically in the past, um, the retail customer base was a slight net buyer of stocks. Um, actually a slight net buyer of ETFs, net seller of stocks, if you look at the data in detail. But you know, sometimes they'd be net sellers of the whole market. Sometimes they'd be just small buyers. Remembering this is in billions of dollars a day and the US market trades about $400 billion a day. So it's not a big um, percentage of net demand, but what's happened since COVID is day after day after day, really consistently, we have seen a complete shift in the net buying activity of retail um, to becoming you know, a net, the net demander of stocks um, at a pretty significantly increased level, even if it's not that much of the underlying market liquidity. Another way to look at what might be happening with um, the US market is just to look at how much the, U the um, trading from retail contributes to the overall market. And so you can see in 2019, we talked about the free commissions increasing trading. And then we talked about in 2020, 
um, the, I guess, COVID lockdowns looked like it increased trading even more. Um, some of the data that we're looking at in terms of how much of the total market in US is retail trading stocks shows it's increased from about 15% to you know, 24, maybe even 25% of the underlying market, like a, a huge amount of stocks being traded by retail. It's a little bit less if we look at it by notional because the retail marketplace likes to trade um, cheap or cheaper, lower price stocks. Um, so they tend to trade more ADV than they do notional, but um, a big increase in their stock trading. But more significantly, you can see retail investors are trading more options as well. And they've become close to one third of the underlying options, or at least exchange options market um, from a, a base much lower than that. So they've almost doubled their usage of options as a percentage. At the same time, the options markets itself here have increased significantly as well. So options are becoming a much bigger uh, contributor to what retail are doing and what the whole market is doing. So I guess if you're a retail broker, this would be the point where you would do a confetti drop and uh, you'd sort of congratulate yourself on how well you'd managed to, uh, I guess, be a part of the market, help uh, retail investors invest, help US households get exposure to equities and dividends and growth. But that confetti drop attitude itself sort of leads me on to the last thing I was going to talk about, which is 2021 retail trading, really the hot topic just retail trading growth and, and the sort of the broadening of, of stock ownership to what's happening in meme stocks. And I think the right place to start if we're going to talk about meme stocks is just to talk about the fact that it is not broad based. It's a relatively small basket of tickers. So in the US, we have about 6,000 companies listed in the US. And the meme stocks typically are about 20 different tickers that trade in you know, small, small rotation, but some of them have been pretty consistently in this list through time. And what's interesting, it's also been a social media phenomenon. And I think that'll be important, uh, sort of obvious why it's important in a couple of slides, but it's been driven by people on Reddit and Facebook. So platforms that aren't classically um, invest, investor regulated, um, but people that are talking at a pretty sophisticated level about tickers and about stocks and about trading. And it's generated a huge amount of activity in just a few tickers. So if we look at, um, this is looking at price change, but we look at some of the price gaps that we saw in January for some of these tickers, they really were, um, I wanna say off the charts, cause I had to rescale this chart a number of times to get these lines to work. And then everything sort of calmed down. And just recently we've seen a, another spike um, where AMC was, was one of the favorite stocks, but GameStop again, um, really trading uh, up a lot and trading a huge amount of volume. So these small baskets of stocks were 18% of all volume in the recent spike. That was 31% of all volume back in January, February. So a huge amount of ADV, not so much um, a percent of value because they were low price to start, but a massive contribution from a small basket of stocks. So hyperactivity in just a few stocks. The thing that's interesting is why did this start in January and why did it restart in sort of you know, late May, June? And one of the interesting things, if we think about it being a social media phenomenon, is obviously before Jan 6, when we have the capital riots here, um, social media was probably focused on politics in the US. Um, there was a lot of tweeting. Um, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, focus on what was happening in the election on Twitter. Uh, a lot of the people were sort of consumed in Facebook in the, in the election stories. January 6, not just was un, wasn't just the capital riot, but um, Facebook and Twitter um, restricted a lot of the people that were being followed from from being able to post, and so it kind of pivoted social media from being very politically focused to needing to be something else. And maybe some of that something else turned out to be um, finance blogging. The other thing that happened in the middle of that zone is Bitcoin rallied to all-time highs and then fell back down before we saw that second wave. So. Oh, I could sort of think of um, the Bitcoin craze is part social media as well. It's driven by um, people tweeting about um, you know what they're doing with social with with Bitcoin, um, whether they like it or not. Um, you know, not necessarily fundamentals based valuation, but just belief in whether this will fundamentally change payment systems in the world going forward or not. And it's a little early really to tell. So if we sort of drill down a little bit into what actually happened in those meme stocks and why they rallied as much as they did, um, it really was a couple of factors uh, above others that, that from a market's perspective made the prices rally so much. And in, especially in the January period, 
the tickers that were focused on were a lot of the tickers that have very high short interest in the US market. It was almost a um, philosophical targeting at highly shorted stocks. And obviously, if you want a shorter stock, um, you typically in the US, you absolutely have to borrow the stock first so that you can deliver that stock to the person who buys it from you when you short sell it to them. So the settlement system isn't disrupted. And so if somebody wants to um, make the stock go up, or somebody buys the stock up, your shorts, so you lose money on the short, you'll have margin calls. And if you try to cover the short, you will buy the stock back. So you'll make the stock go up even more. Um, and so a lot of these stocks, when they started to rally because of the retail buying, it caused some of the hedge funds that were shorted the stocks to actually have to cover um, for margin call reasons or just because they didn't want um, the risk. And so they bought back as well. You can see actually in the data how quickly the orange, red and, and green blobs showed the amount of short interest collapsed within weeks. Each of these blobs is, blobs is two weeks apart. And so the hedge funds pretty quickly got out of all of the, um, the stocks that were highly shorted, um, which made their prices go up more. But it also means that these stocks aren't so heavily shorted in the market anymore either. The other thing that happened both times, but you can see it in this chart, which is from the second wave of the meme stock trading is a lot of the trading was done in options. And so in calls specifically, if I guess if you want to position yourself long in a stock, um, a call obviously gives you that upside exposure with a little bit of leverage um, and some protection on the downside. And you can see in terms of the notional premium being spent in the market on this one day, AMC, which obviously was the stock we talked about with the biggest price bump, was overwhelmingly the biggest stock for notional trading, but also overwhelmingly call buying. And what that does is the options market has lots of different um, calls and puts and strikes and terms to maturity, you really do need a market maker on both sides to be able to facilitate the retail trader coming in or, or the natural trader who wants a very targeted options contract. And so when the buyer of the call comes in and hits the other side, a market maker has a short call and they have to go hedge by buying stock. So it's kind of similar to what hedge funds had to do by buying stock for margin calls with shorts. Um, the market maker has to go and buy the underlying stock because of the call buying, which pushes the price up, which actually in options creates the delta to increase on a call, which means you have to buy more. And so if the price rises too quickly, you actually get the options market makers will add to the buying because they need to add to their delta hedge to keep their book flat. Um, you can see uh, the, the small selection of, of stocks here was a huge amount of volume and of the value, obviously. Um, on this one day, AMC traded multiples of SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF, and SPX, which is the S&P 500 index um, options products, um, more than Q's, which is the NASDAQ 100 ETF, um, more than Amazon uh, options in Notional, which is obviously nearly a $2 trillion company. So really exceptional activity in one ticker, which is a relatively small sticker. And what that translated to um, was just incredible amounts of volume trading in those tickers as well. So this is um, one day back in the first wave in January 27, GameStop, you can see the thickness of the line here is the market cap of the stock. So GameStop, AMC, um, really low market cap stocks, but trading 20 billion, nearly $30 billion in a day. That's more than Tesla trades in a day. It's more than Apple and Microsoft and Amazon trade in a typical day. Um, and so a huge amount of trading, more than their market cap actually, um, in one day. So you can kind of see the, the impact of the retail activity. I would call it hot money um, because it really does seem to come in and go pretty quickly. And it's just creates so much turnover in the stocks, uh, much more than much larger stocks typically see in the market. So I guess the last thing that to note is, you know, if people are buying AMC, if they're buying GameStop, I mean, are they right? Are they wrong? And we don't really know um, whether the stocks should go up more than they were, whether the shorts were wrong. Um, but one of the interesting things is you could say with AMC, it's a theater chain. So it, it plays movies in theaters around America. And when you looked at when the, the rally started, movie theaters were pretty much under attended or unattended. So movie theaters had a huge amount of upside and that was one of the potential arguments for why AMC should rally. But when you look at valuation, so here we're looking at revenues on the horizontal axis and market valuation on the vertical. And you can see other movie chains over time, if they grow earnings, they grow valuation in a pretty linear way. 
what happened to AMC is its earnings obviously fell, but its market cap went up because people bought it so aggressively. Um, obviously, we, we need to look forward because it's a stock and it's all about growth and future earnings. But at the valuation that it got to, its future earnings would need to be literally off the screen to keep track with, with the, um, the horizontal line. So there's a big question in terms of whether the people watching the social media here, whether those investors are being protected. And that has focused the SEC's attention a lot on what's happening in retail here, on investor protections, um, on the gamification, hence my discussion about um, the confetti drop. Uh, and, and I think it's refocused regulators here a lot on the retail side of the market, um, which Initially, the growth in retail was really good for households to get more households in America into stocks. Um, but there's a concern, I guess, for investor protection. And at that point, I can stop. I don't know if there's any questions in the, in the Zoom. Hey, Phil, thank you very much. Uh, very, very educational. Um, there are actually a, a couple of uh, questions here. Um, and I can see that um, that one of them is is referencing back to your segment around the the pandemic um, and the impact of the pandemic or expected impact of the pandemic. Um, and it's also uh, related to another big driver here in in Europe, which is ESG or sustainability, if you will. Um, and it goes like this. In an ESG context, as the pandemic will hopefully soon play a secondary role, do you see green slash climate becoming a number one priority on the sustainability agenda again over social? <laughs> what an interesting question. Um, I mean, it, the interesting thing here is since the election, um, and it's probably partly political because of the change in parties, um, the US has completely changed its focus um, the new SEC, uh, which is our regulator here, has a much bigger focus on um, ESG, on adding disclosures, on knowing more about what companies are doing for the environment and trying to encourage it. Obviously, Biden has a whole um, infrastructure plan that is trying to grow solar and get away from um, you know, carbon emission um, industries and, and change the economy like that as well. Um, I, at the flip side, though, is, is a really interesting question about whether the ESG scores and whether um, you know greenwashing is something people talk about a lot, um, whether it actually adds alpha to a portfolio. And so I think we don't really know if it adds alpha because we don't really have good enough data yet. I, I feel like you're right. We could start to focus on the environment better. The fact that we've had such a bad couple of years in terms of environmental disasters, uh, you know, the fires here, the fires in Europe, um, uh, the fact that uh, there's talk about the, the Atlantic currents, starting to slow down and Greenland having rain. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things going on that, that theoretically floods in Miami will make people's attention shift to whether humans can, whether or not humans have caused it, whether humans can stop it because it's going to start to cost us money, just like COVID cost us a bunch of money. Um, I think the next step is going to be trying to find the factors that actually make a difference. Um, and so this, uh, there's a huge amount of activity all of a sudden going on in that space. Um, I think there is definitely money flowing into the space, looking at the ETF flows, a lot of people starting to put money into whether it's ESG funds or just some of those thematics, the solar thematics, you know, the, the uh, sustainability um, ETFs generally. Uh, I think it's definitely a trend that's starting to grow again, but it's coming from a really low base. And what we really need is good data, globally consistent data that we can, or not audit, maybe isn't the right word, but trust. Um, and then we need to build portfolios that still perform really well based on doing the right things. And I was reading an interesting article the other day that said, you know, really some of the stuff that we need to fix the environment needs governments to agree, like the Paris Accord, like um, carbon emissions costs, because there's a lot of free riding. You know, you, you put smoke into the air. It doesn't really cost anyone anything unless there are carbon penalties. And carbon penalties need to be equal across the world or else different countries are going to arbitrage it. And so there's a few things that I think governments globally need to agree on um, to get everybody on the same page on that as well. I feel uh, a question here also from a customer. Uh, there are uh, Jackson Hole conference are approaching pretty soon. Uh, what are your predictions? Uh, for example, inflation, any rate hikes or something? Do you have any any thoughts about the Jackson Hole meeting approaching approaching soon? Yes, I think the consensus is um, it's summer. 
even though it's Jackson Hole, um, they won't come out with anything radically new just yet. But with, there's been a couple of speeches that some of the um, the voters have given uh, offline or sort of separate to the actual official meetings recently, where they're starting to talk about the taper and they're starting to talk about the fact that overheating is something we at least need to keep our eye on. Um, I think if you wind back three or four months, the feeling was that the Fed was so stubbornly uh, like avoiding the inflation, the conversation and saying that everything that we were seeing was transient, um, that they were going to be way behind the curve and we would have inflation and then we'd have wage growth and we'd have permanent inflation and we'd have a different problem to solve, which would make rates go up um, for sure, but on a delayed cycle. I think now the market and part of the reason rates have come back down, ironically, is the market's getting more comfortable that the Fed is watching this stuff. Um, I think the expectation is still late this year. So maybe even December, they'll start to do the tapering where, and tapering just means buying less bonds, not starting to sell out their balance sheet that they've accumulated, not increasing rates just yet. Although obviously not buying as many bonds might make supply and demand push rates up a little bit. Um, it's a really interesting perspective though, thinking that Biden right now is trying to push through a, a three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure package we need to approve a new debt ceiling here, close to $30 trillion. Um, part of modern monetary theory involves, uh, I guess, what Japan has managed to do, which is have huge amounts of debt to GDP, but also keep rates very, very low. And so if rates go up, if we have inflation and rates go up, all of this debt that we've been loading ourselves up with is going to cost more just to service. And so I think um, what's going to be really interesting, maybe not with the, the Jackson Hole this week, but next year, the discussions from the Fed, how they react, how strong inflation turns out to be, whether rates really do need to go up more than getting back to inflation levels of 2 or 3%. Um, it, it could change you know, pretty fundamentally uh, how the US government is going to finance its debt um, and what the headwinds are for stocks. And so I think um, you know, there, there's a few risks out there in terms of headwinds for stocks. Um, the good news, I guess, is earnings are growing quickly as well. And with the demand, there's a lot of demand for products. So margins are growing and, and revenue lines, the bottom lines are growing. But um, there is some concerns, I guess. The Fed definitely has to start thinking forward about rates and how they normalize and um, you know wh what we need to do with the debt levels going forward and their own balance sheet as well. I don't think it's going to happen this week um, is the short answer to your question. But it is definitely a good question because over the next 18 months, I think that's going to hopefully take over from COVID as the big story. Yeah. So the market will probably be pretty sensitive to uh, the different members who are speaking to different conferences and then uh, by the markets, I guess. Yeah, and in reality, I think um, generally the, all of the governors are starting to get a little bit more, I guess, um, honest about inflation. And so the ones that were very, very stubborn about rates aren't going up, we don't have a problem, are starting to talk a little bit more realistically about the underlying data. Um, and so the, the dot plot, as they say, is starting to move up, which usually means, you know, we're getting closer to rates starting to normalize. Great. Thanks. Yes, uh, Sylvester. All right, Phil, there are plenty of, uh, of other good uh, questions out there, but I think I fear in the interest of time. Um, we have to thank you very much for a very uh, educational and inspiring uh, segment. Thank you very much, Phil. You're welcome. Uh, Thanks so for having me.